Hi guys, welcome to the Canada Puck Podcast, your weekly recap of what's going on in the world of sports, specifically in hockey, and even more specifically in Canada, just as the name implies. I'm your co-host Mick, you can find me on Twitter at Profit Mick, and I'm joined every episode by lovely and talented co-host... Oh. I thought we, we should have like, we should have rehearsed that, I'm like, keep a pen in your hand, I'll pretend like I dropped it to you, but oh well. Have some automated machine to make it look super cool, so when it drops, it actually drops. Anyways, or like hang it from the ceiling, and then you just grab it. Maybe next time. All right. Well, sleight of hand. You didn't hear any of that, internet. I'm Grant on Twitter at Fourth Line Sports. We are over a month into the season now, and I think some clear boundaries are starting starting to be drawn in the league with who's up to snuff and who's really not that good. So. I feel like I have a better understanding now than I did last week. Actually, uh, you know what? That's probably a lie. I don't know shit. Uh, like, I find October hockey kind of means nothing, right? Like, regardless what happens on the ice, it inconsequential. It'll change. November, it, it matters a little bit, but again, it's not the end of the world, right? So if your team is just god-awful, terrible, uh, December is usually the deciding factor, right? If a team kind of starts clicking in December a little bit more, especially like getting into January, that's where it matters the most. So we're still in my mind in not inconsequential because a point is a point goals count just the same now as they do at the end of the season. Right. Uh, but those kind of, we're not in like panic mode yet, but if you wanted to prep your panic button and pull it out and like dust it off and set it up on your table, that's like, you, you could do that now, but it's, you don't hit it just yet. Yeah. Still, the, still the feeling out stage is what I'm picking up. Mm-hmm. I, I I agree. And that's kind of, you know, you hit a few bets throughout the week. You're like, oh, finally. I finally understand this game. And maybe it's just a hot week and everything's going to come collapsing down. I'm not into tempting the universe. So that's kind of why I walked back my my early comments so that the universe didn't make me feel like it had to prove me wrong. Yeah, that's you you are just kind of at that point just setting yourself up for disappointment. Uh, If you were new to the Canada Puck podcast, welcome. A treat for you today, if you're listening to this one, you get two episodes. We had a bit of a technical uh, issue trying to get the video up from last week. Audio is still available, so you definitely will get two videos today. So if you wanted to recap last week, watch like the first like 20 minutes. We talk about teams that are, some of the stuff's probably somewhat relevant, right? Uh, teams kind of where they're going, where they're coming. Gambling advice obviously doesn't work, but you get a double shot today. Mm. Unless you're a podcaster and then you heard us already. That's fun. That's fun. Uh, and if it's your first show, that was a random, I don't know, aside. I meant to say we're going to look at headlines. We're going to recap the week that was for all the Canadian teams. Look ahead a little bit to the week that's going to be. Uh, we have some gambling advice, some fantasy advice. Hey, look at some boobs. It's a fun little Saturday morning. Some say no better way of spending your Saturday morning. No. No, I'm going to hit Home Depot up after this. Nice little Saturday. I don't know, I don't know if I'll have enough time, though. Bed, bath, and beyond, maybe. Yeah, that one? Yeah, I probably won't do that one, but I could. Hmm. Hmm. There you go. So, uh, we're just going to dive into it. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. They didn't even do anything this week. I didn't even get the... F- I got the f- top, bottom five teams on the screen. Grant can't see, but you can. Viewers and listeners, you can't see it either, so... That sucks. Uh, we get to 29th overall. We start at the bottom of the standings, working up in the Ottawa Senators, just like they were all last year. Bottom feeders. They are 4-8-1 and one through the first 13 games. Only They're not even double-digit points. Oh, dear. Oh, my. Is my hot take of they were going to start 3-7? and seven, Did I... Was that was that valid? Am I validated by that? I think they were like 4-6. and six. But then they, they've lost the last three games. So, You know what? I think that you hit the nail on the head with your preseason prognostication. That was definitely not something I was expecting. I thought that they'd be a little bit more competitive. And it's not to say maybe that they aren't being competitive because they are. Their on-ice product is good. It's just things aren't clicking. Offense isn't working. Goaltending letting down. It's like every facet of the game is just eluding the sense right now. So kudos to you, Mick. You uh, you correctly predicted the outcome of the start of the season, but coming full circle with the pre or the pre podcast ramble, is it too soon to press the panic button on the Sens? Oh, absolutely not! Like this team, 
if they're fighting for a playoff spot in April, that's kind of the sky's the limit, right? Like this team is still young. They didn't, they took some swings, but Drake Batherson, they haven't paid him yet. Right, this is still the trying out period. Does Batherson fit with this squad? Uh, Drew was not a long term installment, right? He's kind of in the twilight of his career. They don't really have a goaltend, like, they didn't solve their goaltending issues. Their defense is just abysmal, and you can't just win with two solid hockey lines, right? So, there's still a lot of work for this team to do. Uh, I think they're, we kind of, I know we did that, that power ranking at one point. I, I think these guys are still developing. Tim Strutzel, Kachuk, uh, you know, they're not finished products. Norris is done for the year. So you're missing a lot of play just from him. That guy is huge. Uh, ba- Batherson still going to develop still. Like, I don't, I don't think we're seeing the finished on ice product with any of these players. Don't panic, Sens fans. The problem I do have, though, is when you do bring in the Kachucks and you bring in the Debra Cants, right? You expect more. But I don't think... I think there were probably unrealistic expectations that those moves set for this franchise, right? So are you panicking on our lovable little frisky senators? No, I'm a little upset that they haven't come through with me in, uh, on uh, Vandal yet. I'm not getting any DFS productions. Or every time I go to them, it just doesn't work out well. So Saturdays, I remember Saturdays was like you could, especially towards the end of the season, you could count on the sends. Whether Batherson came back, he had a good end of the season. Chuck was always good. Stunts will also pick things up. So, I don't know. I'm waiting for that iteration of the sense to come back into the limelight because I think that we haven't seen how good this team can be. <laughs> but we can't talk about the sense without talking about the infallible Ryan Reynolds being interested in buying them. Did you hear this? I did, yes. I didn't see the clip from Fallon. That he was on, and he was indicating it, but I, I did see some of the the leavings strewn about the internet. I think we could make friends with Ryan Reynolds and talk, talk ourselves into some sort of position with the Sands. Now, did you follow the story too, where hit where him and that guy from Always Sunny in Philadelphia bought that soccer club? Yep. Apparently, yeah. they made a show on it. I can't remember. Maybe it's on each. HBO. Something I've like seen, that. I've seen clips and it looks hilarious. Like you put those two guys in a room, yeah. good things happen. Yeah, they're funny guys. And apparently they did pretty well. They bought a, a whatever it's like the Div three, Div four team. Uh and instead of saying, Oh, we're gonna like, you know, dust this team up, they something they committed a million dollars to a brand new little stadium or something like that and committed to keeping the club where it is like long term. Uh, and they said that was kind of a big step forward. So in theory, uh they've got some brains behind their money right with this ownership group so if that goes forward i I just don't know how they're going to pick up and move the canadian tire center from where it is and drop it on downtown parliament hill in ottawa that's the only thing i don't understand how ryan reynolds is physically going to do that but well you haven't seen enough deadpool then i'm I'm confident he can pick it up but i just wanted to highlight the dichotomy of a these guys are celebrated as heroes. I can't. I think it's a Welsh club. Maybe it's an English mm-hmm. club. Whatever one it is, they are celebrated as, as heroes in the stadium. They sing songs to Ryan Reynolds and uh, what's his name from "It's Always Sunny." You know how much he's going to get shit on being owner of the Senators. Sure, there will be a honeymoon phase. I can assure you of that. But at a certain point, we're going to start seeing like the devolution of Ryan Reynolds from this handsome happy-go-lucky sports fanatic to what was Eugene Melnick. Like, that's this is the start of a very long slide for Ryan Reynolds. Mm. Hair starts to go. He starts looking a little bit more depressed. He starts getting the bags under his eyes. Blake hate to Lively's see it. He's going to leave him. Like, it's all inevitable. Mm. He buys the sense. I promise you, it is all inevitable. It's true. Yeah. Mm, that's too bad. Oh, well. Sorry. Yeah, but good run. Blake Lively... It's now available to the rest of us, so you fucked up, Reynolds. You fucked up. Uh, moving up, let's see. Senators, what's going on? Oh, Vancouver Canucks, 27th overall. Hey, they got 11 points. Look, they had two points better than the Senators. They do have a game in hand, so. Oh, Vancouver, you still suck. Hmm. It's too bad. I have no shame about announcing this. I haven't been following Vancouver. I know they're doing an Eastern Conference road trip right now. Mm-hmm. Couldn't tell you how it's going. 
other than I know that they're in Toronto tonight. So. Yeah. I mean, like, randomly pulling up player stats, if anyone's following along at home uh, and are interested. Pedersen, 18 points through 14 games. Not terrible. But Horvat, 16 through 14. Miller, 13 through 14. That's kind of it. Oh, look, Mikiev, eight points. Pretty good for four and a half million dollars a year. Wow. Eight, eight shorthand goals already from Mikiev. It's amazing. You can't wow. literally can't penalize this squad or you're gonna pay the price. Is that how that works? No, you can't let them penalize you. That's when they take advantage of you. No 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 no. I know there's a cross check, the guy's bleeding on the ice. We don't want to take the penalty. We'd rather just play on. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Could you imagine an NHL that existed where you could decline penalties? Hmm. Really bring it full circle. Like, we want to be so much like our big brother south of the States. We're going to change all our rules, and now you can decline penalties. That's the latest in Gary Bettman's tirade. All right, let's play a game. Over under 9.5. That Luke Shen is the... Where do you think Luke Shen currently stands? Yes, that Luke Shen stands in this team in scoring. So I'm going to put at 9.5. You know, I'm going to take the under. I think he's riding somewhere between first and eight. Six, seven, eight. He's eight. Wow, look at that, with six points. Uh, if that's not a sad indictment, I don't know what is. But... Yeah, I don't even want to. I know, I know, I, we're, I'm going to talk about them quickly later in this segment, but... Yeah, Vancouver. I don't know. You got to figure stuff out. Luke Shen, really? Your eighth highest scorer? Calgary at 25th? What the heck's going on with Calgary? Like, they just haven't won. They were like 5 and 0, and they were just like, no, we're done. We're, we're going to be on an eight game losing streak. Well, good for the Calgary Flames. Well, good for the Pacific Division contenders. Not good for the Calgary Flames, because, my God, talk about imploding. We talked about how, you know, Nazem Kadri maybe as the lead scorer of an offense isn't the guy that you wanted to target. Mm, panicking has been the theme of the show. Should Calgary be panicking with their third early season disaster? I said don't hit the panic button in November, but kind of, yeah? Like, I, I think so. I think that we're at a point where it's like, well, fuck it. We, we made all these moves. Everybody thought we were going to be the best because we yeah. signed Kadri. You have a lot of money tied up in players that are past 30 who aren't performing right now and aren't playing well in your system that you have in place. I'm pretty sure... Doesn't Lucic play on their top line at the moment? I can't speak to where he plays, but I do know that he does eat up a lot of minutes. So. Yeah. I don't know, man. Players are a function of their system, and... It doesn't look like Huberto and Kadri are thriving with the Flames. Well, and like the the problem is Sutter's system works for the Flames or worked for the Flames anyways, right? And he kind of superseded what the the Goudreau and the Kachuk brought in. But now you've you're overpaid. You're paying seventeen million dollars to Kadri and Huberto, who don't want to play for Daryl Sutter. That's a big problem. And like you just don't get rid of that problem. Like they're now stuck with that for the next eight years. So now you're looking at a coaching change, which shakes up the organization and like sets you back to not contending where you were. You're not take, yeah, this might be a panic. Like unless they can figure things out here. And again, I'm not here to shit on the entire Flames organization because I know that it is early in the season. But even Jacob Markstrom, we talked about the mm -hmm. shelf life of Jacob Mark Markstrom's co contract. Are we already at a point where of regret, where it's like, here we got the two good seasons we were hoping out of him like are we now just like biding time until we can get rid of him or is this just like an early season blip where it's like you know what Markstrom will bounce back and, and we can we can depend on him for at least another good season I I, I, I didn't even want to yeah <laughs> like I've heard him mention goaltending now that's even worse what the heck I'm just saying we're just forwards you can't figure out what's going on in net now granted there are a lot of goalie issues around the league so i would think if you were to move on at least markstrom would be a movable piece but who's taking huberto or a cadre at like seven and ten million like you're stuck with those contracts till they're till they're done right so 
I don't want to say this out loud because, like I said, I'm not really into tempting the universe. But Kadri is the new Lucic. Like, at a certain point, his his value is going to like surpass his on ice product. Yeah, and it's not very long. It's not very far away. So, yeah. Well then, all right. Poor Calgary Flames. Uh, so we've talked about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're eight teams up in the standings from the bottom. From the bottom of the league, we've already got three Canadian teams. We've called the Canada Poop Podcast. That's how poopy these teams are. All right, so, no, we see Chicago and Arizona. They, should, in theory, should tumble. That's that's nice. Pittsburgh, they're hanging out in the basement. Buffalo Sabres. Hey, 20th overall, we get the Montreal Canadiens. Les Belles Provence. Bon suis. So, we actually should be celebrating the Montreal Canadiens in this segment because they're about 12 spots higher than where we expected them to be. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. chat a little bit about it, but they're not terrible. I, from roster construction's point of view, the guys are playing hard. Really, like that's all you can say is they're giving efforts on the ice. Uh, St. Louis got the guys working hard every night. Right, they have a lot of pieces I hate, like individually. You know, like when you go to start a franchise mode, you you, you want a team that has like some maybe some like end of a bunch of contracts, a bunch of young talent. I, I'm talking specifically in like the EA Sports games. Like you go to pick up a Dynasty mode or something. I feel like I would hate, absolutely hate, to play as the Montreal Canadiens, just as they're constructed overall, where their money is allocated. But there are pieces throughout the squad that, like, have glimpses that I kind of enjoy, right? Uh, Josh Anderson kind of sucks, doesn't really do much, but once in a while he has these flashes of brilliance on the ice, and you're kind of like, oh, I could get behind that guy. And they have, like, several players that are like that, and they just kind of get, like, the flashes of brilliance throughout. Sure, they're, they're a fun squad. What do, you, what, do you, what do you want to say nicely about the Montreal Canadiens? I can't. I, I feel stupid reiterating the same points, but I would just want to say that the Habs are lucky that they have Martin St. Louis. Like in a world where there's really. It's a revolving door of NHL coaches. It's just like you've got 35 guys and 32 of them just alternate between the franchises. And I think the challenge with Montreal is always having this like the French presence mm. in the organization. So I want to say whether it's luck or, you know, the universe just doing them a favor, St. Louis is the right guy for them to have behind the bench right now, and it's working out well. And one of the what, one thing what I, that I recognized when the Oilers moved on from, oh, uh, God, the old Coyotes coach, and they brought in um, Todd Nelson, the biggest thing was – the how, like the how changed mm-hmm. for them. Like it was just like it used to be, and you 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 heard these guys say it in interviews where they were just told to cert do a certain thing, and then um, Nelson comes in and he's like, "Here, this is how you do it," and that made the world a difference for them. And they they appear to be thriving at least offensively. Defensive lapses we can talk about, mm-hmm. but they they know what they're doing offensively. So. I think maybe that's the difference for the Montreal Canadiens is just the how. They have somebody who's in there. Martin St. Louis, if you watch some of the practice clips where he actually shows, like, here, create space this way, or, like, this is pivot this way, and you'll create more more of an angle. Like, I feel like that's the difference for the Habs right now. And with a young team, young skilled players that they do have, it's made a difference. So step one of, like, I don't know how many steps. Let's call it a 69-step plan. But step one accomplished. Where whatever step two is, it's kind of that natural evolution that comes with the coaching and the players, and I think that they will eventually get there. Yeah, that's fair. I, I'm we're seeing a lot. Just looking at the stats page here, Suzuki seventy points, Caulfield fifteen, Kirby Doc, kind of looking like a bit of a steal they got from the the Blackhawks there, right? It's Twelve points for fourteen games for Doc. Uh, he's working pretty well apparently uh, with the top guys, getting them kind of clicking. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, you know, coaching is kind of more of a an art sometimes than it is a science. And obviously, he's working well with that the top line. He's kind of keeping those guys focused. But how well does he develop the other young talent, right? How else does he work with 
uh, the, the rest of the team to kind of help them grow. It, it's great if you have three superstars that are going to score, you know, your 50, 60, 70 points a season, but you do kind of need overall depth. So how do you manage injury, right? All those other little things we will see with the Montreal Canadiens going forward. How do they kind of fare? But right now they're, they're dogs and fights. And they're not giving up, right? And that's kind of what you want. They're not hanging their head. They're they're staying frisky. They have the energy. Go Montreal. I don't, I don't expect them to go very far, right? But if they're hanging out 20 to kind of that final playoff spot at the end of the season, that's pretty good. I don't think this team needs to full-on tank at this point to have a successful year, right? If they're in the play for the final wild card that's perfect them in the sense if that's kind of where they end up i think both those clubs would say that's a good year so agreed all right let's keep rolling up so we're into the teens minnesota tampa bay colorado so like those three teams right there in my opinion are probably should be top 10 teams in the league and the fact we're looking at 19 18 17 i i wouldn't panic too much there's a you know a lot of season left to play. Oh, the Capitals. Look, another should be a good team. And we get to 15th. So we're just past top half of the league. And we see the Edmonton Oilers at 15th overall. Yay. So they benefited from that early start to the season on home ice where I can't even remember how many of their games were in their friendly confines for the for a long stretch. A different squad on the road. They did have that big win over uh, Tampa Bay earlier in the week. Mm-hmm. But you saw the consequence of not poor scheduling, but inevitable scheduling, where it was like three games and four nights all on the road against some of the best Atlantic Division teams in the league. Like, when you have to run through uh, Florida and Tampa and Carolina, like, it kind of leaves you in a fucking tough spot. So yeah. they fell flat on their faces against the Hurricanes, but home ice is really where this team thrives because that really is where you let McDavid and Dreisaitl set up to set McDavid and Dreisaitl up for success to have those really premier offensive opportunities. Connor McDavid has 31 points this season. (laughs) He has 15 goals and 16 assists. That's fucking ludicrous. Yeah. Kadri might not get that all season. Man, like 30 points. Unless you're kind of one of your top tier guys, that's a fine, like, realistically, that's not a horrific season from somebody. Like, Connor McDavid, if he just doesn't score anymore, he has, like, how many Montreal Canadiens are going to outscore 31 points? Three or four? Like, he's almost outscored most of the Montreal Canadiens at this point. Man, huh. I was just thinking, like, if you got a 30 point season from Mike Hoffman, you'd be like, here. Good for you, Mike Hoffman. Oh, he exceeded his expectations. Like, I'm putting him on the trade block, right? If he's not in part of my long-term... Like, I'm expecting to get, like, a second-round pick. Like, ma- magical. Uh, there was a scary situation this week with Evander Kane. Uh, got his wrist stepped on. Apparently, he's recovering. So, that is going to be a little bit of a shot to the Oilers' offense and just kind of some of the greediness, as well as the sky is falling with Jack Campbell still. I know you alluded to a little bit last week. He has not come through since then. So... We'll see if that might be a panic button. Jack Campbell might get his own individual panic button that's off to the side that we might have to start dusting off and connect into our sound system. But it's kind of the Oilers. I mean, looking at the standings, they're two points out from Seattle. You're probably going to catch Seattle. So I'm not too worried about the Oilers at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the hot and cold runs with this team too. Like they go up and they go down. And Mm -hmm. I think... Jack Campbell not being who they want him to be is an issue, but Stuart Skinner being better than what they were expecting was also a good thing, and mm-hmm. that's kind of steadied the ship a little bit. I don't know what the answer for Jack Campbell is. I don't know if he needs to get comfortable in the new schemes. I don't know if it was just a contract year where he performed. I know he had kind of a couple good years, mm-hmm. but I don't know. It's tough to rationalize the $5 million that they're paying him at least early on in the contract. Well, it just so think of how much of a battle and like a war. They don't want a technical, sound, uh, re- reflective goalie in Edmonton. They want like their system's almost built for Mike Smith. They want the warrior. They want the guy that's going to come out and like you know throw hits on the ice. That's almost how they're built. And I just don't know if Jack Campbell is going to give them the quality of goaltending. They almost want like 
Dominic Hasek, someone like big and physical, a Ron Hextall on the ice that's going to be, you know, like that extra checking player for them. And I just don't know if you're going to get that from Soup. So You're not. It's funny you say that. So I was uh, – kid was at camp this week, so I had a lot of time by myself. I was thinking, what if Dwayne Rolison didn't get injured in the 06 Cup Final? What if – I think it was Marc-Andre Bergeron. Yeah. Is that who it was? Anyways. Yep, yeah. yeah. Somebody collided with him behind the net. He missed the rest of the postseason. It was game one or two. Oilers go on to lose in seven. If And w- what you're describing in a goaltender is exactly what Rolison brought. So, mm-hmm. And then I started thinking, why didn't we do this during COVID when we had nothing to talk about? What if, why didn't we just do like a what-if series? Like, what if the season wasn't canceled? So anyways, next time there's a pandemic, we're going to just come up with a bunch of what-if what if questions and run through hypothetical situations. But getting back on track, if the Oilers had somebody with a little bit more feistiness, you're right. We've seen them succeed. Soup. Jack Maybe. Campbell's got to not go to the gym. He doesn't need to go, you know, see a psychologist. He doesn't need to talk to a goaltending coach. What they need to do is bring in, uh, like, Johnny Lawrence from the Cobra Kai series or, like, the Karate Kid movies and just get him to teach, like, hard-nosed, hard-as-fuck karate and toughen him up because he needs to learn how to be a battler. Like, he needs to learn how to do wrestling moves, right? Like, send him to the heart dungeon for a couple weeks. Just let him get tossed about because he needs to learn not how to play goalie. He needs to play, like, how do you become the team's enforcer, right? So that's, I think, kind of what he needs to go for. Like, the like the Triple H hair in his face. He needs to be able to do, like, spitting stuff. I think that's what, like, he needs more of, like, a pro wrestling persona. And he'll be fine. Um, I had two ideas. I was like, he can either do a bunch of steroids and just let the roid rage take over, yep. or, or they can just kill puppies in front of him and just see what a, a man that he turns into. Like, oh, like a clockwork orange situation where his eyes are just glued and he just has like horrific things being shown. So like to harden him a bit, that's definitely what he needs. He needs a hardening. I don't know how you get there. Like I'm sure there's some like warehouses in like Eastern Edmonton that he could go out to and there's probably some horrific things he could witness. So maybe send him out there for a week clockwork orange and blue oh oh what you write headlines because like that's what we need and then just like a picture of jack campbell with his eyes just <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with jack campbell he just needs to be tougher he's way too nice to play in edmonton like to be a goalie in edmonton uh moving up two spots we get to the sad pathetic miserable 13th overall toronto maple leafs they I feel like they kicked ass last week. They won a couple games. They beat the Bruins, who were one of the better teams. They beat the Hurricanes. Don't know how they beat the Hurricanes. Uh, they lost to the Penguins last night. And it's kind of their week. But they also overcame goaltending issues this week because mm-hmm. Colgren had to come in. He came in on the Saturday night game. Yeah. What, I don't even know what happened to Sam. Oh, it was the Marchand shootout where he kind of tumbled back. Yeah, and like, shot yeah. And fell yeah. back on his knee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Eric Colgren is the new Jack Campbell, and he's going to get $5 million in two years. Go, Calgren. Go get him. Uh, yes, I, I do believe Matt Murray might be coming back this weekend, so I don't know if he's back for tonight's game against Vancouver or if he's looking to get to the other game on the Pittsburgh series. I, I mentioned earlier, kind of before we started recording, that it just seems quieter, right? Uh, a couple wins really fixes everything sports is a very 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 simple business a couple wins on the board they beat the bruins they beat the hurricanes and everyone's just kind of satisfied in leafs land they had a nice ceremony with boris salming and sundin and sittler last night and the the conversation wasn't the giving up the lead and losing to the pittsburgh penguins it was look at these look at this nice ceremony that they did right so Look at that. All of a sudden, the sky's not falling. This team might be okay after all and go forward. I think we're going to see some ups and downs, especially uh, with... They lost to Vegas, didn't they? They did lose to Vegas. Yeah. Uh, was that overtime? It was overtime. Last I think it was, yeah. So, like, the ups and downs. With Eric Calgren and Nett, I think you're going to get mixed results with this team. If the team plays really, really well, they'll win. If they have a couple slip-ups, Calgary's not going to save you, right? You're probably going to pay for it there, so. I do have a question, though. How long do, how long is Kyle Dubas's job safe if they continue to have goaltending issues? 
I know I fucking bring this up too often, but it just seems like this big glaring omission that everybody else is willing to look past, and I'm not willing to let it go. Like, with Samson all on the shelf now, Colgren coming to the forefront, maybe the team picks him up, but even if Matt Murray comes back and they continue to have the goaltending mm-hmm. issues, does Kyle Dubas get to finish out the year irrespective of goaltending shortcomings? Uh, if that is definitely this team's glaring need, uh, there's a trade deadline, right? If nothing is addressed there, uh, last time this issue came up, I believe Anderson got hurt. He ended up trading, it was like a second round pick and, a, and like a player that I forget his name because Trevor Moore maybe and they ended up with like Kyle Clifford and Jack Campbell. That that basically quelched, right, for a couple years. Uh, their goaltending issues. There are moves to be had. Uh, I don't know if I want to pull the trigger right now just because the price on things are pretty high. But as teams kind of start bottoming out and start heading south and start saying, okay, season's over, let's ship some guys out. Uh, if you can make a decent try, I, I, what more do you want, right? Like, obviously, he's like, look, we tried something. Statistically, this should have worked. Injuries bit us in the butt. I don't know if that's your fault and go from there. Right. So it's kind of, I don't know. It really depends on the, the season results. If they end up in a favorable playoff series and win a playoff round, do, do, do they just sign him to a like a life term contract? If they lose in the first round, is he fired and then hired and wins a cup in Carolina next year? Probably. Right. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not that, that concerned. It's obviously a misstep, but it's better. This year I feel a lot better about our goaltending situation than when they gave uh, Mazarek $5 million a year or whatever they did the previous season, and I was like, it's fucking stupid. <laughs> On the topic of not being able to let things go, that remains a, a sore point in Big Slam. Oh, I couldn't believe. That and the Marlowe deal. Of this iteration since, let's call it the Matthews era, those two deals. I knew they were terrible. They've given up first-round picks. They've Awful, awful, awful signings. So, uh, Toronto, probably all right. You get Vancouver tonight. You get Pittsburgh, who aren't playing great hockey the next two games. They're scheduled in the next five, even. Like, you get New Jersey, Islanders. They'll be all right. Well, you're probably not. Uh, let's keep moving up. See what happens. The Rangers, there's okay. Florida Panthers, Dallas Stars. Is that our top team? At... Eighth overall, we get the Winnipeg Powerhouse Jets. Oh, baby. Oh, baby's right. And I mentioned this last week. It really does seem to be a matter of the universe balancing itself out in a hurry. Because analytically, this team is not sharp. Like, when you think of a, a team that's been as effective as the Jets are scoring, you'd be surprised to know what some of their analytics say. And specifically, the team has, like, negative relative metrics in possession, shots, scoring, um, scoring chances, sorry. And they're still somehow, sorry, high danger chances. And they still somehow win. So all the bad luck, all the puck luck of last year has worn off and they're balancing out with last year's metrics. That's the only, only thing that I can explain. And like you said... Change in voice probably makes uh, mm-hmm. a big difference for them. And I can't even remember the coach's name. The old Dallas Stars guy. It uh, It's working. They are, they are winning games, and that's the fucking be-all, end-all in the NHL. That's it. I mean, a forward core that in, in, includes Pierre-Luc Dubois, Shifley, Kyle Connor. They should be all right. Defensively, again, we could poke fun of Tucker Pullman's of the world. I don't know where Tucker Pullman's up to this day, but I don't, I don't think he's on the Jets. Uh, Hellebuck is a great player. He almost won the Vesna a couple years ago. That just doesn't go away, right? Ups and downs. If he's back and healthy, sky's the limit. Uh, here's a fun game. Who do you think scored more points? Connor McDavid or the trio of Pierre-Luc Dubois, Mark Shifley, and Kyle Connor? Ooh, irony loves fate. I'm saying McDavid. Even. Both 31 apiece. Or, yeah. Huh. McDavid. Just unbelievable. <laughs> but I guess that is... Pierre-Luc Dubois, did they bring him back on just a one-year contract? Yeah. It's like a... Maybe that's what you need to do. Because I know that the Oilers did that with Yamamoto and Puglia Darby. Maybe that's the, the testament that 
young players need to pass or like they need to show that they can do this without the long-term contract for teams to be willing to invest in them. And I mean, Dubois, he's been inconsistent, I would say. He's kind of up and down, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Maybe the one-year contract is the way to go with this guy. Yeah, well, he seemed kind of... I don't know, flaky, like whether he wanted to stay with the organization, he wasn't really sure. So the fact that they're getting focus from this player, who I think is, in theory, a not elite player, but a very, very good player in the league. Uh, and yeah, if you're getting focus from that guy, sky's the limit, right? So. And yeah, another, yeah, coaching changes do make a difference for yeah. players. And maybe it's just, this is a new regime and, and it works better for Dubois. Who knows? We'll see how it all plays out, but right now it's tough to bet against the jets just the way that they're playing mm-hmm. but they have struck an unsustainable balance they bottom 10 in expected goals for top eight obviously in points percentage so i don't know regression is looming but i'm not ready to say that this team's about to lose a whole bunch of games they just can't continue this play like this the season is still early We've said that a couple times. I said, don't press the panic button. So if we're just looking at the top 10 right now, we have Vegas at top. That makes sense. Boston Bruins. The New Jersey Devils hanging out at third. Probably not sustainable. The LA Kings being a top five team in the league. Probably not going to happen into the year. Uh, the New York Islanders at six. And the Seattle Kraken at seventh overall. So of the, just the top seven in the league. I could see maybe three of those teams sticking around, but we will see a change of scenery in the next week, two weeks, month, two months. So, again, we don't need to panic. We love to panic, but I think the panic, it sounds like it's quieting down a little bit. People are, you know, becoming more subdued. Unless, of course, you're the Calgary Flames, in which case, burn it down. Yeah, time to burn that mother down. Burn it down. Uh, So that ends our headline segment keeps up to date with what's going on let's look at fantasy before we do that i love to go to the nhl daily picks because they never steer you wrong these guys get paid to tell you these picks guys so players to watch for goals kevin fiala for the kings playing detroit tonight uh, if you want assists alec pectorangelo for the knights it's not a terrible one power play points of course they're going to come from bo horvat bo horvat they love their power play points in vancouver And then finally, shots on goal. (laughs) Shots on goal. So of all the players in the league, anyone you can pick in FanDuel, they recommend Noah Hannafin, defenseman for the Calgary Flames, playing the Winnipeg Jets tonight. That is NHLs.com's. And someone got paid to write that. Watch Noah Hannafin's hattie on on 12 shots. (laughs) Just peppering peppering the goalie. All right. Uh, FanDuel. Let's pull up our history last week. I did maybe the worst I've ever done. At one point, I was 47th out of 51 when I was checking at about 8 o'clock or something like that. And I was like, I have literally never created a worse FanDuel lineup. I apologize. I was thankful that we had technical issues and we couldn't actually put the video online. Uh, luckily, most of my players I ha- were in the Anaheim-San uh, Jose game, and that didn't go till like 8.30. So I got a lot of points afterwards. I finished uh, ninth, won two bucks. So it was a happy yeah. ending after all. Something that we've come to expect from Mick is always that happy ending. Mm-hmm. Mm, less so on my end. Austin Matthews was a good call. but And Brady Kachuk came through with six shots and an assist. But nobody else recorded more than, no other skater recorded more than 6.4 points. And Cam Talbot's 12.8 was really my undoing. Hmm. I was so surprised that this team, like, if I knew 17.5% of people were going to draft Cam Talbot, I would have stayed the fuck away. Cam, I, I thought I was playing, like, you know, going under the radar with my picks. But, my God, 175 thought Cam Talbot was worth drafting. Just insane. Uh, same with Chandler Stevenson. 15.4% drafted, 4.8 points. Utter disappointment. I was looking good at the outset just because Matthew scored early, mm-hmm. but from there it was all downhill, and uh, nothing came up grand last week. Crummy, crummy. Uh, yeah, for myself, top guys. Uh, Thomas Hurdle. He had uh, one goal, one shot, two assists. Uh, 30 points was at my high guy. Jack Hughes, the powerhouse there for New Jersey. Kids turned into a hell of a player. Got me 27.7 
points. And then both Elias Lindholm and Noah Hannafin both got me 20 points. Those were kind of the big guys. Everyone else just kind of mediocre. So, But tonight, oh man, tonight, today, whenever you're watching this, uh, ooh, I've got a day-to-day. -day. I don't like that. That's not good for advice, but uh, I've got a, what am I doing? Who is this? I have the best goalie I've ever picked on a lineup. I'm really excited. I did this last night. <clears throat> Can't wait to tell you about it. Uh, do you want to do the honors? All right. Let's leave people with the cliffhanger because I do want to keep them guessing. I'm excited to know. I think people are excited to know. So we're going to make them sweat it out a little bit. I am back to the Maple Leafs well. A little bit of a stack here. I am going Matthews, Marner, Sandin. Um, I don't like... What's Sandin worth? 38. Ooh, that's you're nice. Not to, you're not allowed to change your, your roster, Nick. We've talked about this. Yep. But, I, I have one change I might need to make just because my guy's day-to-day. -day. So, uh, yeah. If it's a defenseman. Anyways, Matthews, I think, is coming in so undervalued. And we've talked about him as a natural progression candidate. Uh, Marner, I, in my opinion, is the best leaf. So pairing them together made sense on the top line. Power play minutes. Sandine, another guy where it's like, you know what? He doesn't his value doesn't reflect his on ice product and I think that he's gonna do well. I also went to the New, New Jersey Wells, New Jersey Devils well today. Uh, but I, and I was thinking long and hard about um, Jack Spratt over there, but I ended up going with and I was referring to Jack Hughes. I don't know why I called him Jack Spratt. But anyways. I, I knew exactly who you were talking to. I'm glad you clarified though in case anyone was concerned. <laughs> Nico Hishire. I expect big things from him. Right. Um, and another guy, low key, what was he? Thirty eight hundred. If getting dad and all, we talked about the the Montreal Canadiens having a good mm -hmm. bunch of skilled players. This guy is substantially below his expected values. Starts like sixty percent of his shifts in the attacking zone, but his output doesn't match production. So I'm expecting him to start progressing the other way. Pittsburgh's in a bit of a tricky spot. I think they're on the second night of a back to back. Mm -hmm. Or did they play last night or Thursday night? Anyways, it was last night. Yeah, so I, I think Montreal comes out to play. Um, last four guys, I went Philip Ronick, be on um, Detroit, Alonze Kopitar forward on um, LA, Alexis Lafreniere forward for the, the Kings, and I paired him with Shesterkin, who is on the road, $7,900. It feels like a bit of a trap for the Rangers tonight, but Nashville hasn't played exceptionally well. So I'm hoping that this is the uh, Rangers game to lose. Nice. Solid, solid. Uh, so there we go. So all the suspense. Grant's been waiting this whole time. At $8,500, I went with New Jersey Devils goalie Akira Schmid. Uh, I'm going to take the New Jersey Devils goalie. I would, one career start, and it was a shutout. They're playing the Coyotes tonight. They're playing good hockey. Uh, I mean, the Coyotes actually aren't playing horrendously right now, so I'm just kind of going for the win with that one. There you go. Akira Schmid. That's way too much for that crappy player. Uh, two utility spots, both at $54 and $4,300. Boone Jenner uh, playing the I Blue Jackets at the Islanders. And then we have Winnipeg Jets in Calgary. Elias Lindholm, their top-line center. He won them a series against Dallas last year. I think this guy at $5,300, I realize he's not producing right now, but when he goes off, he's going to hit you. At $5,300, that's one of the best plays I've ever, like, I think I almost broke FanDuel with that player. So $5,300, Elias Lindholm. Love him at 53. Uh, we're going to go to the defense. We've got John Klingberg. Basically, he's just playing to get out of Anaheim at this point, trying to win a cup at $5,100. And Owen Powers. He had a bit of a... Or in power, not powers. That's the the secret agent. Uh, Boston at Buffalo tonight. I don't hate that play. He had a bit of a hot streak earlier this season. Let's see if he can maybe find the back of the net. Forty six hundred dollars. Don't hate that. And then up front, on wing, I've got Mitch Marner, seven thousand dollars. I've got Jack Campbell, Vegas. St. Louis is in Vegas tonight at eight thousand dollars. He's healthy. Looks like he's having fun playing hockey again. $8,000, not terrible. I like the Kopitar play. And then I've got Jonathan Huberto at $4,800. I know he's having an abysmal start. We kind of talked about pressing the panic button at $4,500, though. Man, that guy's talented. 
maybe he's just hurt, right? He is day-to-day at this point. So I have an extra $600. My 48 plus that gets me up to $5,600. And there's like nothing. I really want no one in that spot. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I want to do with my last player here. Well, I'll tell you what I did. And that is you were so high on Lindholm that I took out Kopitar. I put Lindholm in. And then I started thinking, I've got four hundred extra dollars. Should I mess with some of the defensive spots? Phil mm-hmm. Bronick maybe coming out or Sandin coming out. I decided to just keep the four hundred dollars. But Lindholm is out, or sorry, Kopitar is out. Lindholm is in, at least on my line. Uh, I, that's all. I like. I, I think the return, the potential return that you can get on that fifty six hundred dollars comparatively, like he's worth. If he is the shot, and they can set him up a couple times, right? Like they get lucky that some penalties go their way. Two goals. Two goals and assists, like two points. I, I could see that easily from Lindholm. It's a steal of a deal. Uh, I'm literally on dart throw territory. Uh, who do you like? What do you, what, what, you know? Uh, Let's see here. I'm just going to go back. You said 5,600 is what you You know what? I made fun of him. He's worth $4.5 million. He's worth my lineup. Ilya Mikiev, short handed goals. Oh, revenge game. He's coming back tonight. And he's like, guys, I'm worth it. There you go. That's my play. I made fun of him earlier. Ilya Mikiev for Vancouver against Toronto tonight. Good for you. Good luck. I like the uh, the red revenge angle. I always like those games. Oh yeah, yeah. Less less so. Uh, also, I heard something. Claude Giroux playing the Flyers. I don't know if that's the early game though. I don't know if that one's actually going later. And I, I think it already started. It already started. started. All right. Yeah. That, I, I usually stay away with those ones, but I mean, if for some reason you could like live bet Claude Giroux point anytime goal or something like that, I could see him. I could see him kind of being like, "Fuck you guys." Wasted the best years of my life. <laughs> Crying over his Philly cheese steak. Why did I stay here? So <laughs> oh, you guys can't even win the World Series. <laughs> Alright, so there you go. So we talked a little bit. I got other soup. Ilya Mikia apparently is also named soup. It was very confusing with him and Campbell last year on the Leafs. But now it's all cleaned up. The Vancouver soup uh, is going to probably get a shorthanded hat trick tonight. Yep, bring that up shorthanded total, point total up to 11. Good for Liam Mickey. Cool. And then you can see my sweet uh, NFL fan duel line up there, too. Uh, it kind of looks shitty. I just emotionally hedge. I just literally make a lineup of all the guys I'm playing in fantasy that week because they like. <laughs> I always find that people go off against me, and I, I, I do all right. So. Can't complain, then. Good for you. I uh, Inadvertently, I had the same strategy last week where it just turned out I was like, doesn't matter what happens because Grant White's going to be a happy cat. And I was. I, I get behind the emotional hedging when it comes to fantasy sports. I get it. Smart. Smart. Just, it just makes like the sting hurt a little bit less. And speaking of stings hurting a little less, uh, we get to go to our favorite segment where we look at... I don't know what the study of bees called, but I was going to... Th- Apurist. Apurist. Yeah, so we're going to throw to our local apiarist for his local update on what the bees are doing here in Calgary. All right. Well, I had a good week last week. I think you had a not-so-good week last week. Uh, I emotionally hedged $50, both Leafs, Leafs beat, Bruins, Canes. Woe's me. I hit all three, I guess, all technically all four of my bets. Red Wings came through as underdogs, 3 nothing. Knights Montreal took a while to get there. It wasn't until the third period where the floodgates opened, but went over six and a half. And Jersey Calgary, you talked me out of Boston. It, you didn't mm-hmm. intentionally talk me out of Boston, but you mentioned something. I was like, you know what? You're right. I'm going to look past this. I ended up going New Jersey Calgary overtime. All three bets hit. I ended up so it was plus three forty three ninety three for me last week. Adding it, I did some quick math. Um, I'm up 285 on the season. I'm up 185, so there you go. Huh. Nice. Cool. Uh, I'm my uh, the anatomy of my place has not changed, so I have four. I have three. So right. either either or. I'll I'll lead off then. I uh, we've been talking about the panic button enough that I just thought maybe this is naturally the one to lead with, and it's a nice tie into your your DFS segment my dirty fantasy because i really like the spot for the calgary flames tonight the prices come tumbling down on them um and maybe rightfully so because they've uh they're just not the same team they were last year at least early on 
minus 162 to back, back them as uh, home favorites. I think that's more than a fair price. Like I mentioned, Winnipeg isn't the team that they've shown to be, and regression is inevitable. Kind of the exact, and the Flames fall on the opposite end of the of progression regression spectrum, and they probably aren't as bad as we've seen. So, anyways, minus 162, thirty dollars to win eighteen fifty-two. Sweet. I believe I have all underdogs. Uh, I could do a grant and put them all together. I don't think they're all going to hit though, so we'll do that. Uh, if we scroll back up here, where are we looking at? Uh, we're looking out of the fair in the great city where Josh Allen throws a football around. I've got the Boston Bruins visiting the Buffalo Sabres. The Sabres have been frisky. Tage, Tage Thompson is a fantasy darling. FanDuel's got him at like $10,000. It's absolutely ludicrous. Uh, the Sabres are playing probably a little bit above uh, their expectations at this point. And I think the Buffalo Sabres have a fighting chance. So at 2.5, I'm going to bet $33 to win $82.50 on Les Sabres. To beat Le Bruins. That's a bold play. I like it. I also looked at Tage Thompson. I was like, how the fuck is this guy all of a sudden worth $10,000? I'd have to go back in time and see what did I get him at? Because I feel like it was only like $6,000 that one week where we went off for whatever it was, like a 70 points and won me a bunch of money. And then ever since then, he's done nothing. I was looking at him last night. He's been very mediocre with like 12 points a game. Yep. And that sounds like par for the course. It's like a weird fan duel where they're just like, well, we'll overprice him. And hopefully people remember that he once scored 70 points in a game and then not adjust. <laughs> yep. I don't know. I don't get it either. Maybe maybe this is the second coming of, uh, like, we're entering, like, Connor McDavid pricing here at $10,000. Even Austin Matthews is typically in that range. 95, I think. Mm -hmm. So anyways... Paige Thompson, the new sweetheart of the NHL, apparently. But anyways, best of luck to you on that Sabres pick. Um, Fate loves irony. The Schmidt goalie you're referring to was outstanding in his uh, career opener. I don't think he's going to be so lucky against the Arizona Coyotes, but I'm also not ready to say that Arizona's going to dispatch the mighty Devils, who are apparently third in the league right now. So all of that's to say is that I think this this one gets sorted out in overtime. I could see, you know what? I could even see Arizona walking away with the shootout or overtime victory. Uh, plus 390. It's, there's always that one game where, like, how the fuck did that one go to mm -hmm. overtime? That's the one that I think it is tonight. $30 to win 117 Sweet, sweet. Uh, so I got a little French with my last pick. I'm going to get really French with this pick. I'm going to take the Montreal Canadiens taking uh, Pittsburgh Penguins. They've been on back-to-back -back, uh, on the road. They won Montreal, or Toronto last night. They're going to Montreal. Montreal's maybe a tough place to play. So at uh, 2.35, I'm going to put another $33 on that at, for $79.20 in return. Uh, let's go La Belle Provence. And wouldn't that be great? Like the Penguins, you know, beat the, beat, the, beat the Leafs, and then you beat the Penguins the next night, and then Montreal will sit there and talk about the Leafs all night. Because, again, I don't think about you at all, Montreal, but I know you think about me. Well, there's a nice easy segue into my pick because I also am not high on the Pittsburgh Penguins tonight. However, this is my favorite spot to bat, bet shootouts, and that is second night of back-to-back. -back. Mm -hmm. So, superior team, bad circumstances, Montreal's good at home. To me, the makings of a 65-minute of a game. Uh, Montreal, Pittsburgh, plus 340. $30 to 102 And to round it out, if you parlay all three together, which I've done for $10, 338.69. Sweet. Solid, solid. And then my final pick, you know me. I'm an emotional man. I cried like seven years ago. I'm not proud to admit it. I'm going to emotionally hedge the Vancouver Canucks to beat the Toronto Maple Leafs at home. Uh, $2.45, $35 on that bad boy to bring you $83.30 in return. That that I'm feeling less sure about this one. I, I feel more a little more confident that the Canucks suck and the Leafs will just kind of rise above. But at the same time, pretty sure the Canadians or the Canucks beat the Leafs last year because I think I lost a lunch bet on it. So I'm going to make that same lunch bet. I'm going to recoup that losses. I'm going to get me a, my sandwich back. Steak sandwiches? Yeah. Not even on special. Like full price off the menu. Oh, damn. Yeah. I was going to tell you. 
community center down the road. Steak sandwiches are ten dollars, I think, Monday to Thursday at lunchtime. Anyways, if you're in the area, there you go. Let's get some. So there you go. There's my little emotional hedge. Uh, playing around with some uh, underdogs this week. So that is that wraps up my dirty fantasy. No, that's better advice. My dirty fantasy was the other segment. So. Well, you know what, Mick? You're my dirty fantasy. I don't know why. <laughs> We haven't used that before, but there you go. It was coming. It was like a long, long like a long term play there. So sweet. Long so that, time coming is long. exactly what it was. Oh. You know the Ghostbusters song, right? Speaking of com- weird coming puns. The Ghostbusters theme song? One of the lines that's been looking at you your entire life that you probably never noticed. I never noticed until someone pointed out to me, is one of the lyrics in that song is Busting makes you feel good. <laughs> wow yeah i could definitely i i can hear it in my head now <laughs> it, it, it's there forever i was walking around walking the dog this morning going busted makes you feel good and i'm like man that's filthy god damn busting makes you feel good my god well you know it's an appropriate way to wrap up the better advice in my dirty fantasy there you go sweet yo uh with that it's kind of the show uh, Grant, you got anything for us before we leave for the day? Yes, because the Canada Puck Podcast would not be the Canada Puck Podcast without our bagel team. So, we started off with hockey ladies. Well, that's the theme of this year is hockey ladies. And it was all players. However, I have found one of the darlings of the LA Ice LA Kings ice crew uh, Kylie Nicole you can find her on Instagram at Kylie K-Y-L-I-E underscore Tuttle T-U-T-T-L-E and uh, my god this lady has Southern California written all over her just love what she brings to the to the team energy enthusiasm obviously she's got the other intangibles Kylie Nicole Tuttle is our babe of the week. Shaw Wing. Shaw Wing. Oh, she's dressed up as the Hulk in this one. That's cute. I saw that one. And then she's like, also, I have green face paint on. You might as well just make me the mask. Jim Carrey's character from The Mask. Don't I look like Stanley Itkiss right now? (laughs) If I had to choose between banging female Hulk, She-Hulk, or The Mask, my preference will be the She-Hulk. But, you know... That hat, that flat brimmed hat, maybe that does it for me too. I don't know. Does her jaw drop open really big if she's Stanley Ipkiss? <laughs> I mean, that kind of amplifies things. I mean, mm-hmm. that changes the discussion a little bit. How bald is she? Are we talking like Stanley Ipkiss bald? Mm. I don't, I'm not sure. Also, weird that I might know that I like. I don't know if I've ever, actually ever seen the mask with Jim Carrey, but for some reason I know that is that's his character's name. So, well, you're missing out because that was a good one. That was like Oscar worthy. I'm gonna go out on a limb here right. and say that was Oscar. Maybe I'll add that to the the docket at some point if there's like a little bit of a movie uh, movies going around. So, Ben Stein makes an appearance. You can't win his money in the movie, but I'm pretty hmm. sure he's in it. All right. Sweet. Cool. So with that, though, I think that's it. We're done. You guys are now ready to enjoy your Saturday night of hockey. It's good times. Nothing but the best here. We, uh, we'll we be back next week with more, hopefully, panicking. We can't hold off on the panic button too long. Maybe the soup panic button is just getting fucking hammered. Who knows? Yeah, there'll be lots of panicking. Like, we have a little heat map in, like, the two little areas in Alberta. And the rest of the country is, like, pretty chill. But, like, it's going to be, like, a big heat map. It's going to be kind of the opposite of what's going on with the weather in this country. So, yep, yep. there you go. That's that's kind of analysis you want. So, all right. Uh, see you guys next week. And I think before we go, we have to say, party on, Grant. Party on, Nick. We'll see everybody next week.